Now on Book TV, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Lucinda Franks remembers her marriage to Manhattan District Attorney Robert Morgenthau. It's just over an hour. Nearly exactly seven and a half years ago this evening, I stood on this stage and introduced a program featuring a new book by a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who had turned the focus of her reporting on a central figure of her life and looking inwardly and unflinchingly crafted an intimate portrait of a life and a relationship. That journalist appeared in conversation on this stage with a consummate professional who anchored their discussion with poise and sophistication. When the program was over, I remarked that those in the audience had been witness to one of the very best book programs that I could imagine. The journalist and author that evening was Lucinda Franks. The book under discussion was My Father's Secret War, and Lucinda's interlocutor was Dan Rather. But tonight, we have reassembled the same winning team and welcome Lucinda Franks and Dan Rather back to the museum. This time, we mark the publication of Lucinda Franks' newest book, Timeless Love, Morgenthau and Me. In 2007, in commenting about Lucinda's memoir about her father, I spoke of its depth and honesty and its compellingly human story. I spoke as well of the absorbing hold that the book took on me and about its gradual revelations of deeply personal history. I would use the same words in speaking about Lucinda's newest book. One must admit it can be a tricky enterprise indeed to focus a professional reporter's practiced eye on the most intimate spheres of one's own life and the lives of those closest to her. Lucinda Franks manages to do this with a gift for narrative, a refreshing lack of self-consciousness, and a pal palpable devotion to the man she loves and who loves her deeply, who happens to be the former chairman of this museum, whose name is above the door as you entered this evening, <laughs> my boss, the boss, Robert M. Morgenthau. Now, I will confess that in reading the book, I learned more about Bob Morgenthau than I ever thought I would. And this evening, I look forward to learning more about this deeply personal and compelling book. And we're pleased, extremely pleased, to welcome Dan Rather back to our stage. As a correspondent and anchor and managing editor of CBS Evening News, Dan Rather covered nearly every important story in the last third of the 20th century, even before that. He brought a rigor and honesty to his reporting that won him the confidence of a generation of Americans who watched him as I did each night. I think it's safe to say that Dan Rather spent more time in my living room than any other person with the exception of my own family. These days, Dan Rather is the anchor and managing editor of Dan Rather Reports on the cable TV channel Access TV. I can think of no better person to conduct this evening's interview, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming Lucinda Franks and Dan Rather. Well, thank you very much for that very warm uh, introduction. And we, uh, we have a lot of goals here this evening, one of which is we want to have fun and talking about Lucinda's great new book. But I would be remiss, and I think you would agree I'd be remiss, as we start, if we don't uh, pay our respects to uh, the great Robert Morgenthau, who is, if not on every page of the book, is through the book. <laughs> A great warrior for freedom and democracy, he was in two theaters, Atlantic and Pacific, during World War II. 
and since then, a great warrior for justice, one of the great district attorneys in the history of the country, never mind of New York City, Robert Morgenthau. Mr. District Attorney, we pay our respects to you. But this is Lucinda's night. I know the district attorney would agree. Lucinda, Timeless turns out to be not only a very good read, but a deep book. It's been advertised, and we all understand why this is the case, as a love story. But anybody who's delved into it recognizes it's much more than that. It is a book, it is a love story. It's a lot about marriage, how to make a marriage work, how to get through the tough times of marriage, but it's also about history, political history of New York City, political history of our own beloved United States of America. It's about terrorism, 9-11, behind the scenes, back behind the cloak of what it's like, what it's really like uh, to be a district attorney in the pre and post 9-11 eras. It is all of those things. Having said that, what do you want the reader to take away from the book more than any other one thing? I think that uh, what to me at the end of the book was most important was that Bob and I we stuck together and uh, we didn't abandon each other. We didn't, uh, you know, because of a month of arguments or a bad year, uh, you know, turn our noses the other way. Uh, we kept reinventing things. And in, this, in the book, uh, we come across a man who totally changes our view of each other because he sees me as someone that Bob knew when he first married me. So he laughed at my jokes, he took pictures of me, and he made Bob feel like he was a young million dollar person. And after Frankie had left us, we met him in Portugal, we just we just had a new view of each other. And I think this is what you have to keep doing, is finding ways not to work at you know, marriage, but finding ways to reinvent what you have. What was the worst day of the marriage? <laughs> Listen, nobody gets through it unscathed. Any of us who've ever been married know that very well. I think one of the worst days was when I couldn't convince Bob that the CIA had inadvertently uh, been complicit in 9-11. I had done a lot of research. Uh, I'd even found in my research a quote from Bob in New York Magazine saying the CIA and the FBI have not cooperated with the law enforcement uh, community. And if anything led to the 1993 bombing, it was them. So when I confronted him with this uh, uh, quote, uh, he said, I don't remember saying that. You know, Bob doesn't like to look back. That's what makes him a great district attorney. And uh, he had trouble keeping in his mind that, you know, our intelligence agencies had, were in bed with terrorists who were their informants and who were also committing, you know, crimes of bombing and whatever. So he finally did admit it, but it took a long time for me to convince him that the research I had done pointed to the involvement of the intelligence. Well, I will say that among the more surprising portions of the book, and also the most interesting, among the more interesting to me personally, was this area, discussing, looking back, the FBI, CIA, uh, what they might have done, could have done, should have done, uh, 
But I'm going to ask the companion question, having asked you what was the worst day of your marriage and the best day of the marriage, or the best time of it. After our first child was born, <clears throat> Joshua, I found a way to stay in the hospital for a week because <laughs> Joshua had to stay in the hospital for a week because he had a little bit of jaundice. So uh, Bob would come in every day with another nice wine, uh, some pastries, some little, you know, doodads from Dean and DeLuca, and, you know, pay tax and whatever, and we would have a feast. And, you know, he, he at first he wouldn't, he didn't want to take the baby because this was a very little baby, and he was kind of scared of holding it. But I said, excuse me, I have to go in there for a minute. Will you hold Josh? So I just put him in Bob's arms. And when I came out, they were laughing at, laughing at each other and rubbing noses. Uh, so it, it was a, a magical time. I can imagine that it was. I want to loop back to something I meant to ask earlier. Who are you, Lucinda? Who is Lucinda Franks? You tell me, Dan. <laughs> uh, I guess what I have become is a person with a life of her own, with a profession of her own, with some modicum of success, uh, someone who likes to help people and to do the right thing, and met a man who also, like his father and his grandfather before him, was determined to do the right thing. And I think in, in, in spite of the fact that I was a radical hippie and he represented the establishment and everything I was dedicated to destroying, being a part of the anti-war movement, uh, we came together in a way that uh, you, when you are caught by love, <laughs> there's nothing you can do to disentangle yourself. And boy, did I try. I thought, you know, marrying a man 30 years my senior, uh, with five children, two dogs, one cat, a house in Riverdale, and I was used to sleeping on church floors and marching, you know, and throwing blood on draft files, and Bob Morgenthau could have put me in jail. Well, you mentioned he had five children before, and you write that the families were not, at least in the beginning, not receptive to your engagement, and that may be an understatement in some cases. Now, how did you overcome that, or did you ever really overcome it? Uh, we did. I think it was very hard work on Bob's part who had to walk a tightrope between his children, two of whom were my age, which does not make it very easy. You know, there's the Oedipal complex and there's lots of other things that makes it difficult. Uh, and we had actually gotten along very well until we announced our marriage. As soon as we announced our marriage, I sort of moved into the uh, realm of, uh, you know, quasi-enemy. Uh, but we all worked very hard. There was his younger daughter, youngest daughter, uh, was 13. And, you know, I could never replace her mother, who had died when she was nine. But I tried to be there for her and to be as helpful a friend as I could. And I think this helped bring everybody else in. And, you know, time Time creates new things, and we created a new blended family. You created a new blended family, but anyone who listens to the story knows it could have gone the other way. And we've all known families in which it just, instead of getting better, it got worse. Is there one thing, one critical thing that happened or that you worked on that you think was decisive? In bringing us together? Yes. 
This is one small uh, thing. Uh, when the old house that Bob grew up in, that belonged to his father, uh, beautiful house on, on the apple orchards, uh, was sold and divided up between Bob, his sister, and his brother. Uh, there had to be the division of the contents. And division of the contents and the belongings of everybody who thinks everything belonged to them is very complex. Now, Bob was busy that day. And Surprise, right? Yeah, yeah. And he said, will you go in my place? And at first I was honored. And then I thought, oh, no. You know, here I am, a little bit of an outlaw. Uh, still, and I'm going to go around and claim the popcorn bedspreads and the, you know, uh, her, his father's desk. Uh, so when I went there, uh, I I was assertive, uh, but not terribly. Except there was one thing: a lap rug, an old-fashioned fur lap rug that you wore in the rumble seat. And it had belonged to Bob's father. And I happened to know that Bobby, his second son, uh, second oldest son, really loved that rug. Right. So I bartered everything for that rug. <laughs> and when I brought it back and gave it to Bobby, he was extremely touched. And he said, not to me, but to somebody else, now I really know she's on our side. And I can imagine how helpful that was. You answered the question about something that you thought was decisive. It's really only one thing, but this certainly helped. Did, uh, did Robert Morgenthau bring home the office with him? Did you discuss cases? Did he bounce his feelings, his anger, his frustration, his triumphs with you? Or did he seal off his public life? Both. Uh, <clears throat> this is very hard to explain, but sometimes when cases were pretty clear-cut but uh, sort of cloudy at the same time, like the Bernard Getz case, when uh, Bernard thought he was being uh, attacked by a group of young African-American right. kids and uh, shot at them and paralyzed one, the, the city was divided over burn, Bernie Getz and let him off. So Bob was really stumped at this because it was a very, you know, very complicated case. Was Bernie Getz um, looking at a real threat or were these kids just hacking around and panhandling? So Bob and I played out the roles of the victims and Mr. Getz. Um, then we switched, and he was the victim, and I was Bernie Getz, and we switched back and forth. And this exercise, which really goes back to, you know, to the EST training of long ago, uh, it, it helped him decide what the right thing to do was. And he decided to indict Bernie Getz for shooting at these unarmed kids. What do you think is the, the biggest misconception or the misconception that bothers you the most that people may have about first your union with Bob? First what? Misconception of? that people may have about the union of you and Bob, about the, the two of you being together. Well, I think in the beginning, I, I didn't realize this because I was, you know, I was a radical. I was, you know, an anti-war protester. My whole life was dedicated to that. And the, the least thing I wanted to do in the world was to have riches and to live a luxurious life. So when... Bob and I fell in love 
which seemed to be counterintuitive. He was one thing, I was another. We were like an oxymoron because we were two different kinds of people. I think there were some people who thought, well, this is a fortune hunter. Uh, this is somebody that wants uh, to um, get fame from marrying fame. And when I forgot, uh, found out about this a bit later, I, I got furious because it was exactly the opposite. I, you know, married Bob in spite of his fame and in spite that, that he was a well-off person. Well, one of the highlights of the book, and there's so many highlights, was the conversation, and I won't replay the whole thing, where the mayor, Mayor Koch, calls uh, and interrupts what should we say, a uh, gentle way to say this, an intimate moment. <laughs> And uh, when the, tell me about, he had a conversation uh, with your husband, with Bob, and when the phone went down, it was a conversation about you saying, or any of my old friends, meaning your active friends, involved in this. Recount that. I think the audience would love it for those who haven't already read the book. Uh, we were playing around in bed and just playing, and um, the phone rang, and it was his private line, and he immediately reached for it and said, hey, Ed, how are you? No, 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 it's not too early. Uh, and I'm saying, uh, and then what Koch was saying, I could hear, was that there was this so-called revolutionary who had shot a guard and that Koch was recommending that the prosecutor go for the max. In other words, recommending that Bob go for the max. And he said, uh, we'll do what's right, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And uh, I was afraid that this was one of my friends. So I said to Bob, uh, who was this person? Was he somebody I knew, a friend? And Bob said, well, I don't really know who your friends are. Um, this was new in our relationship. Uh, and I said, uh, well, you know, maybe there's some mitigating circumstances, like he's an idealist who just happened to commit violence because of the capitalist hegemony. Um, and uh, then Bob said, well, and I said, there's nobody that can tell you what to do. I know what you'll do what's right. And he said, nobody but you. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I, I really was coming right off of the anti-war movement. And I thought cooking was very bourgeois. So um, I, was, I offered to cook an egg. He knew I couldn't cook an egg. So he said, I'll pick up a bagel. And I thought, I, then I said, I'll make some hash brownies. And he laughed. And I just happened to have leftover from my draft dodger boyfriend a little bell jar full of green stuff. And he had never asked what it was. I don't know whether he thought it was dried rosemary. Uh, but I thought at that point, I better throw that out. Because I didn't use it, he didn't use it, and it wasn't a good thing to have in the district attorney's house. <laughs> uh, to put it lightly. Well, that raises a question. When you got married, or maybe even when you contemplated marriage, did he have what I would consider to be understandable requests? of things that you should not do, or things, say, listen, I'd appreciate if you don't associate with these people, or I'd appreciate if you stop smoking something that's very expensive. Did you have those kind of <laughs> conversations? Well, in a sense, uh, we agreed not to step over the line in our, each other's professions. I was not going to write about anything that he was involved with. He was not going to mess with my stories. And uh, we also 
sort of had the agreement uh, that we would support each other in as best a way as we could support each other. But Bob is a very laissez-faire person. And he wanted me to continue my career and continue my successes. In fact, he kind of liked seeing my uh, name on the front page of the New York Times. So he was very supportive. And I was supportive in, in being able to brainstorm with him. So it, it really very naturally worked out. And I didn't get any dictums or uh, that, you know, I wasn't to wear um, jeans to um, cocktail parties where, where the governor was, although I, I didn't. I learned how to dress. Uh, but, um, you know, he was, he was very accepting. Now, when it comes time to write the book, bluntly put, did you ask his permission to write this book, Timeless? We were sitting in a very romantic restaurant. He was, Bob loves food. And he was eating something he really loved. I think it was pork chops. And I said, um, <laughs> <laughs> Only because he remembered that they were pork chops. Uh, I had been, I have to feel a subject uh, in order to write about it, just like I felt my father. And we had been married then for 32 years. Uh, I had gotten the irony and the sense of irony and the sense of distance in order to write about him objectively. And I really felt like I wanted to write about him. So I did not expect this reaction. But I said, uh, sweetheart, uh, do you um, think I might be able to write a book about you and I, you know, about you? And he looked up and he said, do you think anybody would read it? <laughs> and I said, I think so, sweetheart. He said, well, you could give it a try. So he probably would have let me write this book without ever looking at it. But one of my uh, moral stands was that he had to read every single draft and more than once. And he ended up doing this. And he corrected commas and semicolons. He really got into it. Uh, and a lot of people have asked, how did you remember what happened? How can you know what you said 20 years ago in Greece looking at the statue of Apollo? And uh, the answer is that I have kept journals uh, since I was in college. And uh, I have an auditory memory. I can remember, if I focus, remember what people say so I can dart in and write things down or just write things down in front of people. And so he read and, and corrected some of my mistakes. Some of my mistakes, I showed him the journal and said, it happened this way. And he said, OK, all right, fair enough. But we, we, we you know, had a, a happy uh, experience doing it. Were there times or not in which he said some version of, wow, this is true, but I'm not sure you should put it in a book? There were a few times. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you resolve that? I didn't put them in the book except for a few. <laughs> And they were innocent, you know. I mean, this is, we're not talking about cases or, you know, secrets. We're talking about, you know, things everybody does. Well, things everybody does, but not everybody writes about it. And no. Did you worry? Now, we've talked about his concerns. Did you worry that people reading the book might say to themselves, too much information, too much information about not just a private life, but intimate life. Did, were you concerned about that? And if so, how did you balance it out with, and wind up with something that you, you were comfortable with? 
I never worried about it because writing a book is kind of like, you know, being in an old car and, and it won't start and it coughs and it coughs and you don't get it, you know, right. And then suddenly you whiz along and you just write. And it's afterwards in the editorial phase that you take things out and I took quite a bit out. But I felt some things were so amusing and so interesting and were only uh, talked about in one line, which was totally innocent, not graphic at all. Uh, and I thought, well, that's part of our marriage. And you can't have a book about marriage without mentioning some of these intimate details. What did you hold back? <laughs> What I held back <clears throat> was, as I said, Bob is an extremely uh, accepting person, very laissez-faire. He would read a chapter, and I would have to watch him at the end of that chapter and look for a little muscle that might, you know, flick or a little, you know, batting of his eyes. And then I knew. I said, what don't you like? <laughs> and he said, no, it's your memory, um, not mine. And I said, no, no, it's, it's our memory. I want to know what you didn't like. And it would take quite a bit of teasing for him to tell me that he didn't like a so certain thing. you had to thing. extract it. Yes. Yes. Well, did you give him, did you grant him veto power over anything? Well, he could say, look, I don't want to talk about it. I'm just asking you, sweetheart, to take this out. Yes, I did. I definitely did because, you know, there was no sense in writing a book which he didn't approve of. Sometimes I talked him in to certain, you know, to leaving certain things in. Uh, but anything that he really didn't want in. And there were even some things he got a little emotional about. And out they came. Were those, did those tend to be personal things or things about his work? Personal things. Let me just for a second talk about history because I mentioned coming in that this book is many things, but I said among the things it is. History of New York City, history of the country. How has New York City changed over the breadth and span of your marriage, 32 years? Well, when we got married, uh, or a bit before, when Bob was single, he tells the story that he had to walk down a, a dark street to get home. And he didn't walk, he ran down the middle of the street. Crime was that, you know, rampant. Uh, now, um, I mean, you know, there were hundreds of murders per year when he took office. And because of the work of the police, because of Bob's work, very complicated computer work, the um, number of murders in Manhattan per year is something like four. So it's a, a much, much safer city, I think. And for our country, you've seen it change. And I'm calling on now your skill as a reporter, and if it needs to be noted, I would expect it doesn't, you won a Pulitzer Prize in your early 20s for your reporting. But let's talk about our country, our beloved United States of America. How has it changed over the span of your marriage? Because you talk about it in the book. I think that one of the reasons that Bob and I came together politically when we were on opposite sides of the fence is that the culture did change. The counterculture, the you know extreme anti-war movement, it died. But what was left, what rose, was changes in the role. Feminism changed the role of women, maybe not as much as we'd like, but it did change. And Bob ended up uh, coming into office with two women. He left the office with something like 350 women. Uh, 
you know, for minorities, opportunities have, have proliferated. And uh, there is a, I think there is a, a gentle and kinder uh, ethos to the city, which we did see after 9-11. And I think we still see now, you might not agree with me, but after 9-11, people were hugging each other and crying, and everybody knows what, what happened. Uh, but it just seems to me that, you know, you can get a smile from somebody on the street. Well, I certainly agree with you in the immediate wake of 9-11, that the country came together uh, in a way that I had not seen since World War II. Uh, I, as a personal opinion, I have been disappointed that it faded as quickly as it did. It's another subject for another day about why that happened. But I don't think anyone uh, who was in New York during the time of 9-11 can go through a September, any September, without thinking about it a lot. And here we are in September 2014. Mm -hmm. Have you and Bob been talking about it? Have you discussed it? Or is it too far back in memory? Well, we've talked about it. We've talked about it in terms of the post-traumatic syndrome uh, that have affected people that were survivors of 9-11. And we've talked about PTSD, which he's worked a lot on, uh, you know, in, in soldiers from Afghanistan, Vietnam, Iraq, uh, but we also began talking about the kind of PTSD that you do not think of when you think of PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And that is that I think it's only 30% of sufferers of post-traumatic stress syndrome are soldiers coming back from, from the wars. The rest are people like you and me, who have had serial traumas in their life. And <clears throat> this uh, closed them off emotionally, sometimes, many times. The higher functioning people, it closed them off. It closed Bob off in a number of ways. I was going to ask you, I don't mean to interrupt the flow here, and by the way, let me note, and I say this gently because I've been corrected before, the preferred way now is post-traumatic stress disorder. You don't call it syndrome anymore. Ah, politically correct. Well, <laughs> and I think medically correct, but we all know what you're talking about. Uh, let's face it, when this happened, the district attorney's office is right on point to say nothing of the firefighters, the police, and the other first responders. Was this something that touched Bob and touched you and Bob personally? Was it a factor in the office? Let's talk about that. It, it was amazing. Uh, when Bob came home that night, late, it was like 5.30, and everybody else was coming home at, you know, early in the day. He was, you know, smudged with soot because a big cloud that had come from the uh, explosions, which were not far from his office, kind of hovered around the street that he, you know, the, the Center Street and Hogan Place. Uh, and time stopped when he came in that door and we just hugged each other. Uh, I had a different reaction a different way of coping with 9-11 than he did. He began to talk about all the acts of heroism that he had seen. And um, this is so Bob because he's the glass half full. He's always an optimist. He's always taking the best out of everything. Whereas I was a little more circumspect and I started doing research on who was responsible for 9-11 and coming, you know, to the end, to the CIA, <clears throat> which uh, uh, paid so many informants that, you know, they had informants doing the bombing and they had informants 
doing informing on informants. Uh, uh, as an aside, I just spoke with a, a medical authority on PS, uh, PTSD just yesterday. And she, it was it she, reminded me, she said that many New Yorkers suffered PTSD in the wake of 9-11, but very few people wanted to talk about it. It was her opinion that some still want to go into that. Question, are you and Bob past it, all past it now? I don't think so. <clears throat> Bob uh, had a, a very rough time in World War II. His uh, first destroyer was sunk. He was marooned in the water watching his men go down, not able to save more than one or two. Uh, he then went on another destroyer where kamikazes just you know, peppered the destroyer and put a torpedo in it. Uh, after that, very shortly after the war, his father, beloved father, came down with hardening arteries, and Bob had to care for him. Bob wanted to care for him. He was the only one of his siblings who did. And then his much-loved wife, Martha, uh, got cancer and had a terrible, long siege, which Bob was involved in her care. And I think all of these, and then the, there was also the, a plane crash, which his mentor and idol, Judge Patterson, was killed in, and Bob was supposed to be on that plane and wasn't. Uh, all of these shocks made him go inward. And this, as I said, what is what makes him a very successful man, but also he is somebody who doesn't show his feelings, sometimes even hiding them from himself, while also being a very tender and very loving and very generous man to other people. I do want to point out that we will have a 15-minute question and answer session which will be coming up fairly soon. I want to get back to, you said that your reaction to 9-11 was that of a journalist. Let me find out what happened, what really happened here. Let's talk about a bit more about what you found out uh, about the events of 9-11 and the terrorism campaign against the United States that had, pre that had preceded that. It began with, uh, or it began much earlier in Afghanistan when we funded uh, these guerrilla fighters that were helping the guerrilla fighters in Afghanistan fight the Russians without really knowing that the people we were bringing in uh, from Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries were very anti-American and that their plan and they were even called Al-Qaeda. They called themselves Al-Qaeda way back then. And their plan was, as soon as they were finished with the Russians, they were going to come to the United States. And they had an open invitation from the United States because, from what I understand, Saudi Arabia made a deal with the United States that if they gave all their terrorists, which they didn't want anyway, to the United States to fight in, in Afghanistan. The Americans afterwards would bring them to the U.S. and make them citizens and support them and, uh, you know, give them homes, whatever. And what the CIA didn't realize and the D, DIA and all of the intelligence agencies didn't realize was that they were helping build Al-Qaeda. Uh, in, in, and and Al-Qaeda was, there, there were little branches in, or, or one or two people in Missouri, in Mississippi, in Decatur. Uh, and at some point, they all came together, highly financed by what they had made in Afghanistan 
from, this, from the intelligence agencies, and then further supported when they came to the United States. Well, I want to point out that there's a good deal about this in the book, as I made a reference to in the beginning. While the book is often cast as a love story, it is that. I think people uh, may be pleasantly surprised by how much of this kind of substantial information is in the book. And we haven't mentioned the FBI, which uh, Bob, Robert Lobenthal, has said uh, repeatedly before, during, and since that the FBI has a lot to answer for. Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't think uh, the World Trade Center bombing in 1993 would have happened. And I think that Al-Qaeda would have been identified and broken up had the FBI not sequestered 14 boxes that they found in the murderer, so the house of the murderer of Meir Kahane, the extremist rabbi from Israel. Uh, and the police and the FBI put out the story that this was a lone gunman. And they put it out uh, very strongly, you know, almost surprisingly. And they, in actual fact, these 14 boxes show they had bomb materials, they had blueprints of the World Trade Center, they had tapes from uh, Abdul Rahman, one of the leaders of Al-Qaeda, urging people to arm and to get bombs to destroy America's great World Trade Center. Well, again, there's much about this in the book. Plus, there's so many stories. One of my favorite in the book, which is, uh, I don't say, maybe two-thirds of the way, three-fourths of the way of the book, an occasion in which our district attorney, our being those of us in New York, Robert Morgenthal, did what one would have hoped the federal government would have done, and that is expose the laundering of money out of Iran to buy weapons, including the makings of weapons of mass destruction. The Iranians were laundering their money through uh, a bank in Great Britain. And uh, despite repeated efforts to get the federal government involved when they didn't, then Robert Malkenthal, our district attorney, moved on and exposed that whole case, and there's more about that in the book. I want to move from the heavy thing. We're about to move into our question and answer session, I think. But you've obviously had a lot of fun during your marriage. What's, yeah. What's been the most fun? Uh, the way we joke, his dry sense of humor, my hanging out, you know, all over the place sense of humor, and how it played, uh, our travel, um, just our, our conversation. We have that to this day. We, we, we can't shut up at restaurants. You don't see us two silent people eating. You see us chattering away. Well, we're going to move to our question and answer session fairly quickly. But before so, this gives me an opening to check something. Now, I have my reporter's hat on. I've heard this story, and I'm checking with you, and you would know whether it's true. That everybody knows that uh, he has, when necessary, Bob has a stern exterior, uh, but we also know that he has a sense of humor, which you outline in the book is a great sense of humor. Now, I'm told, and I'm checking with you, is it true or not, that one of his favorite stories is about one of his friends who is roughly his age, 95 or 96, I think it is, and the story is told to me is that the story that Robert Morgenthal likes is that his friend had a birthday 95th birthday, and some of his friends said, you know, it's his 95th birthday, we should give him something special. And not Bob, but they took up a collection, and they hired a one-time Miss Playboy <laughs> to dress in a, a very nice costume and go to the door of Bob's friend, as Sarah told this to me, and when the friend opened the door, she said, I'm here to give you super sex. 
And the friend answered, I'll have the soup, please. <laughs> Is it true that he tells right. that story? Uh, well, if you say so, it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure he wants to claim it. I think now would be a good time. We're going to move to the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Lucinda. We're going to Thank move you, to the question. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Now, the way this will work, there will be microphones. As I understand, there are microphones available in both aisles. And if you will raise your hand, keep in mind that we have lights in our eyes here. We may not be able to see you as clear as we'd like. And this is an important note. It's really important to hold the microphone close. Uh, this is being recorded uh, for play on television. So if you can make sure that you have the microphone uh, close enough where we can hear you quite clearly. So, uh, if I may, the gentleman over here. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, it's quite remarkable. I did not know about the cover-up by the FBI of all these documents about Al-Qaeda and uh, with Maya Kahani. Uh, my, my question is, why did, what was their motivation for doing such an amazingly stupid thing? Uh, and. Uh, Furthermore, even though there's been no major attack, I mean, this one was predicted in advance by Reuters, London, etc. Do you think we're significantly, based on your research, significantly safer now than we were before 9-11? I mean, are these, is Homeland Security really effective? Are they communicating effectively and transparently with each other? Uh, well, the first part of the question is, uh, if I understand it, is how uh, did the FBI, how was it so stupid or so corrupt as to not identify the conspiracy? Well, they told Bob, Bob's office, that they didn't have an Arabic translator. Therefore, they couldn't translate the boxes. However, they wouldn't give, him, give them to Bob's office who was prosecuting which was prosecuting the case. So a little investigation on Bob's part and on my part showed that um, both the FBI and the CIA had a number of, as I said, informers, people that were keeping them apprised of what al-Qaeda was doing, except that it turned out to be the whole of Al-Qaeda that was informing. Uh, so that was the reason, from what, what we understand, that the FBI and the CIA wanted to keep this terrorist conspiracy under wraps. Also, uh, the CIA tried to stop Bob from investigating the BCCI case, the bank of credit and commerce, also called the Bank of Crooks and Criminals International, uh, because the CIA was paying these terrorist informants from mo the money laundered money in the bank that he was investigating, in BCCI. So that's part of your answer. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. I'll come to you in just a moment, ma'am. That's all right. Let's take this and I'll come right back to you. Yes? As journalists, how can you tell the difference and how can you help us learn to tell the difference between truth and exaggerated media via both social media and print and television news? Because I feel a lot of times there's much more to the story and I am not a very political savvy person, and if I think there's more, people who are more savvy than me have to know there's more. I think you, you've, you're right on the money. Now let me say, first of all, that television used to be very reliable, investigative, uh, really a, a major information gathering organ in our country. This is when Dan was there, and uh, people like him. Television news, in my opinion, 
now has become just recycled. Uh, either, you know, uh, terrible uh, crime stories or, you know, the same shooting in Iraq, the same this, the same that. They don't go into depth. There are very few investigative reporters left, even on the New York Times. Uh, so I think you have to judge by the people that are writing the stories. Uh, and you have to learn to recognize who those people are that you can trust. Like Thomas Friedman in the New York Times, he was always completely trustworthy when he wrote about the Middle East. And I just think you have to go to the source and be your own doctor, be your own judge of what is real and what is not real. If I may tack on to that very quickly, because I want to get the next question will be the, the lady here on the third row back, because I passed her earlier, uh, that it needs to be recognized by news consumers without believing the question, that what once were major news gathering organizations in television have now morphed into far more news packagers. And there's a tremendous difference between having a worldwide news gathering organization and an organization that to the contrary doesn't have many, to use the phrase, boots on the ground, but packages the material of others. And that's an important distinction to know between what is today and what was yesterday. Going down to this lady right Could here. Could I just tack something on? Sure. If you turn to AXS TV on the HD uh, network, am I right? Right, access, yes ma'am. Yeah. Uh, you'll find some investigative reporting by Dan, which is amazing. Things like uh, the fact that, that the Muslim community, a large part of it, was against the United States long before we invaded Iraq. And that this was there and we weren't recognizing it or dealing with it. Thank you, Lucinda. I appreciate it. You've been very patient with us. Thank you, madam. No problem. Uh, Lucinda, one thing I want to tell you that I learned a great deal about World War II from your book. But I have a question. Where did you hide all of those notebooks? I'm particularly interested <laughs> in the bedroom. <laughs> I don't see you having a notebook right now. Did you have a notebook every place you went with a pen that writes and when you answer that one I have another worry. Well, I worry that right now everybody is going to have in their bedroom um, a phone that can record everything. Right. So I want to know how, how did you do that that you recorded um, all of the details? Uh, that's a very creative idea to have a number of notebooks hidden around your house. Uh, I just usually keep one, uh, you know, if I have jeans on in my pocket. If I don't, if I'm going out in my purse, I'll, you know, whip one out. Sometimes I'll, you know, pop into the ladies' room and write down what I've heard. Uh, I, we had a, a dinner party um, in which Ariel Sharon was there and Arthur Gelb and Barbara Gelb were there. They were very, Arthur, you know, has passed away, was very left-wing. Barbara is very left-wing. And uh, Sharon had just invaded Lebanon and was not very popular in anywhere, particularly the United States. And they had such an argument that it was, I was just itching to listen and write at the same time. So I kind of did it surreptitiously because they were so involved with themselves. And uh, I'm not sure I got everything, but uh, you know, when situations are like that, you have to be very creative to, uh, to record them. Uh, let's just take the gentleman here uh, near the middle. <laughs> Thank you. So 
uh, my name is John Doyle, and I was an assistant U.S. attorney in the office of Bob Morgenthau when he was U.S. attorney. And uh, in fact, I was uh, assigned to prosecute uh, cases against the weather or other underground, so I was one of the enemies <laughs> you had probably personally. <laughs> but um, uh, you and your friends, uh, you've talked about, this is before you met Bob, you've talked about you and your friends being on one side and he being on the other. And my question is, uh, in your community, or among your friends and you personally, uh, were you aware of um, the work that Bob was doing with regard to white collar crime, uh, securities fraud, <laughs> organized crime, uh, labor racketeering, official corruption, uh, tax evasion, Swiss bank uh, <laughs> cases, <laughs> all, all of the things that uh, he did that were pioneering as, as U.S. attorney. But this is before you met him. My question is, was there a balance in your view of him uh, at, at, during that period of time? Absolutely not. I mean, the anti-war movement and the cultural revolution really had no use for anybody over 30. And all of them were just deluded architects of the Vietnam War. Uh, when I married Bob, or when I was really dating Bob, I was astounded by how he changed the system by working under the radar and uh, sometimes over the radar when he stretched his you know elastic arm into international you know uh, countries to try to stop money laundering and uh, stop drugs uh, terrorists and when I found this out, and I also found out that he had at a certain point refused the orders of Ramsey Clark, who was a uh, U.S. attorney then, to prosecute draft dodgers. And so he didn't even do what we were accusing people like him of doing. So it was a very deluded generation, although a very idealistic generation that did change things. And I think when I found out that Bob could work this way, it's what really made me change my views about the Cultural Revolution. I think we have time for perhaps one more question. I want to make sure that I, have, I, I see you there. So yours will be the last question, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much. And thank you for a marvelous book. Um, to what degree did uh, Mr. Morgenthau's involvement with uh, Jewish life, with this museum particularly, for a long, long time, what effect did it have on you? Were you involved in it at all? Does it still involve you? And in what ways? Uh, yes, I, I identified very much with Bob's passion uh, to build this museum because his father tried to save as many Jews as he possibly could during World War II. And in a way, he was finishing what his father had started in my mind. He wanted people to remember always what happened and from that, eventually, to save Jewish lives that would otherwise, you know, perish in, in another Holocaust. Uh, and this, this beloved feeling he had for his father really was the engine that drove him to the personal part of it. And, and then, of course, you know, his whole character was based on, we have to be, build this museum. We have to have a place where New Yorkers can go, children can go, and see what has happened and can never happen again. 
We're near the end. Lucinda, you've been wonderful and very generous here. What question have we not asked you that we should have asked you? <laughs> I don't know. You've been pretty thorough. You've been an investigative reporter uh, squared. Well, the book is timeless. Uh, the author is Lucinda Franks. It's been a wonderful being with you again, Lucinda. Thank we you, wish you so much, Dan. Thank You're you. amazing. You are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, all of you, for coming. <laughs>